Good morning, Gators. Good to see you guys out there. And uh, I come from a, uh, a long line of people who like to get microphones in their hands, and that's nece not necessarily a good thing. And Miss Hampton back here, she's out here. Miss Hampton, uh, I believe you have a quiz next bell. Is that correct? Yes, okay, I thought so. Um, I just want you to know that there were several students that asked me specifically if I could make this run long. That's okay, they'll take it home. All right, but, well, we had some cash exchange hands on that. So, Tanner, I hate to tell you, I'm thinking twice, and I'm not going to allow us to run a little late, so I need you to come back up here and get your $20 bill. Don't hold that against him. Sorry, sorry. Now, the other thing I was going to say, <clears throat> my dad taught me this years ago, is to be careful when you start thanking people, because invariably you leave someone out. All right? But I'm going to ignore my dad's wishes, and I'm going to thank a few, few people. First of all, Mr. Thompson and Miss Gibbs, what a wonderful job you guys do in putting the place and worship together. And all of you young people who are doing the praise and worship, I love it. And I'm usually in the back, and I really enjoyed sitting up here. It's a little closer. And uh, just being able to experience firsthand the ministry that you guys have. And I, uh, I compliment you for that. Dr. Kevin, up in the, in the sound booth up there. Faithful, always there, making sure things are moving right, the sound sounds right. Good job. Dr. White, for putting this school together, what a privilege it is. And I would be completely remiss if I did not recognize Mr. Matt. Okay? Now, what you don't know is Mac and I went to Atlanta last year. Dr. White sent us down to investigate a program. And we had three or four days to talk and get to know one another and what have you. We're both from the Midwest. He grew up in Michigan, I grew up in Ohio. And there's a restaurant chain out there called White Castle. They make the finest hamburgers that have ever been made. They're about this big. They float in grease, okay? They're very good and they're a great value because if you eat one for two or three days later, it's still with you, all right? I like them, okay? Mr. Mac detests them. So, Mr. Mack, I do need you to come up because we have a presentation to make. We have, you must come up. We have our White Castle t-shirt. And by the way, Jana washed this. We picked this up in November when we were back in Ohio. She did wash it for you to get the grease smell out. Dr. White, I see you back there. If he wears this during chapel, does he get a dress code or is it okay? No, no, he definitely should. He should. You all concur? I don't trust you. <laughs> okay. What I do want to do for just a, a few minutes. Is he being bad? Again. What I do want to do is just for a few minutes, I want to get some ground rules down. Because to help understand the purpose of this chapel, if you're not careful, if you're not paying attention, if you're sleeping like Mr. Mack had that analogy, you know, the, the, the wall leaners over there on each side. I see you seniors back there. I know what you do in my class, and I know you do it here as well. But what I do want you to know is follow along with my PowerPoint. Uh, it, years ago, there was a television program called Lost. And Lost, some of you like it, good on reruns, Loss was interesting because it perfected a new concept in television, and it was called the flash forward. Okay, we're all familiar with flashbacks, but Lost would use the flash forward, and sometimes it was very confusing. And my wife and I would watch this thing, and it was like, okay, what's going on here? I don't understand it. So you're going to see a lot of flash forwards, and you're going to see a lot of flashbacks. Okay, and what we're going to talk about is a bicycle. It's like, okay, this is chapel. Uh, Mr. Mack gave me the opportunity, and the administration gives me the opportunity to be up here unchecked, and it's like, wow, should we allow him to talk about a bike? But stay with me. 
because I think this is all going to make sense to you, but I want you to kind of meet the players, if you will, not on the screen, but it does get a little confusing. A very good friend of mine when I was younger was named Steve White. His father was Dr. White. And uh, no, no, this is out in Ohio. When I talk about Dr. White or I talk about Steve White or whatever, the White family, please understand this is a family of some very good friends uh, out in Ohio. Uh, they had four kids. I was one of five. All of my sisters and brothers and Steve's sisters and brothers, we were all about the same age and we were all very, very close. All right? So what I want to do, before we talk about bikes, I want to take you back to 1953, the first of our flashbacks. This is a Chevrolet 210. All right, it's a pretty common car for back in the day, kind of rounded, cars were kind of dumpy in those days by today's standards, all right? They, I don't care if you had a Plymouth, if you had an Oldsmobile, a Lincoln, whatever, they all looked about the same, okay? 1953 was the year I was born, by the way, but it was also the year that the Chevrolet Motor Division took a concept of an automobile and they turned it into this, all right? That's a 1953 Corvette. First year, there were 350 of them made. It's the first fiberglass car that was ever made. They sold for $3,495, which included an AM radio and a heater, okay? And that was the Corvette. And that styling rocked the automotive world completely, completely changed it. Not to be outdone, the Schwinn Bicycle Company entered into a licensing agreement with the Chevrolet Motor Division, and in 1954, they came out with the Schwinn Corvette. Now, that bike is a good example of what bikes looked like back in the day. Tall, if you were an older boy, you had a 26-inch bicycle. If you're an older girl, you had a 26-inch bicycle. They're all, you know, just bikes. It's what they were. Other than way back when they had the penny-farthing bike, that was the bike with the big front wheel, the little back wheel, right? That's what bikes basically looked like. Now, let's go back to our 53 Corvette. The 53 Corvette, that's a C1 Corvette, all right? That's the first generation of Corvette. And the C1 Corvettes, continued from 1953 to 1962, right? And they changed and they modified. Most importantly, what Chevrolet did is they put a big motor in it, finally. The problem with this car is it had a little six-banger in it because uh, the other divisions of General Motors would not share their V8s. And in 1953, Chevy didn't have a V8. That's why these cars were so underpowered for the first two years. But they morphed slowly. And in 1963, 10 years after the first Corvette, Chevrolet came out with the Corvette Stingray. It's the first of the Stingrays. And that car, by almost anybody's standards, will, people will tell you that is probably the most beautiful Corvette that was ever built. The unique feature was the split window in the back. It was a stunning feature. Interestingly enough, it made visibility a little difficult uh, out the back window, and in 1964, they took that split out, okay? 63 Corvette, a very desirable cor uh, car, all right? Let's go back to our Schwinn Corvette. We saw the car morph, and in 1963, still with their license and agreement with Chevrolet, the, Schw the uh, Schwinn Bicycle Company rocked the bicycle world because, again, this is what bikes look like. That was it. But then they came out with this. Whoa. And that bike changed everything. And what they did is they took a small 20 inch frame and they put high handlebars on it that they called banana, hand, or excuse me, butterfly handlebars at that time. They put a high seat on it that they called a banana seat. And guess what? Big kids could now ride a little bike. And it totally changed everything about the bicycle world for good. And what you guys ride today, there are tie-ins back to the Schwinn Stingray. Okay, now, my good friend Steve White. Steve, because his dad was a doctor and they had some money, he was the first kid to get a Stingray, all right? And Steve's Stingray was, was it was called flamboyant green, beautiful bike, and we all wanted to ride it. If I back up one, 
I'll show you some things, a little bit about this bike that make it very unique, but regardless, we'll talk about that later. That first Stingray, Swin Stingray, was very unique in a lot of ways because in 1965, they started to change that bike considerably. They would do little things to it to make it even more rideable for bigger kids, okay? But in 64, Steve got his. All right, in 1967, by the way, in 1964, Steve and I are 11 years old. In 1967, we move away from Waterville, Ohio. That's where uh, Steve and I uh, grew up together, and we moved to a town called Zanesville, Ohio, which is near Columbus, if you're familiar with the, uh, the look of Ohio. And with that, when you move, unfortunately, oftentimes, friendships kind of are like the wind. They kind of disappear, they, they move on, and you don't see one another again. All right, and I started my new life in Zanesville. Now, flash forward. We've moved to 1994. By then, I'm married. Ashley, our oldest, would have been 14 years old. Amber, our youngest, would have been 11. All right? And what I never lost the desire to do was to get a Schwinn Stingray. Always wanted one. Okay? We didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid, and we couldn't afford one, quite frankly. They were $49, brand new, okay, back in the day, but $49 was a lot of money. Always wanted one. So then one day, we're in Jana's van with the kids in the back, and I'm going down Johnstown Road, heading toward the heart of Great Bridge. And if you're familiar with that, there's a, there's a little road called Britwell right there, and out of the corner of my eye, it's a Saturday morning, there's a yard sale, and I see it. I slam on the brakes, and Jane is going, what, what, what? I said, I saw it, I saw it, I'm turning around. She said, what? There's a Schwinn Stingray at that yard sale. I saw it, and I knew it, okay? Pull the car, I, my heart is beating, I'm just so totally fired up. And I start to get out of the car, and Jane goes, wait, I want to know how much you're going to pay for that bike. I said, $10, max, $10, I promise. So I went, I talked to the lady, and she gave it to me for four dollars and i was just like i am totally wired okay so we go do whatever we're doing that day and i get home and i get the bike out of the back of the car and i'm going to tell you as a bike it wasn't worth much more than about four dollars because the bearings were all rusted later on when i took the bearings out they were literally powdered my right? bike was rusty it was ugly but it was a stingray okay and I start, I think I'm going to start restoring this bike, but I don't know how to do it. And then one night, I'm reading Hemmings Motor News. Dr. White here, you know what Hemmings Motor News is. It looks like, a, looks like a phone book, an old phone book. And you can find anything for any car in the world in Hemmings Motor, Hemmings Motor News. And I'm flipping through it, and in the back, there's a bicycle section. And in the back, there's two ads for people who specialize in stingrays. It's like, whoa, I want to talk to these people. So I do, I start talking to him, and I realize, A, this bike, the 1963-64 Stinger, it's gonna be hard to do, because the parts are very unique and they're hard to come by, and it didn't take me long to realize this could get a little expensive, okay? Now, keep in mind, that bike had been in my garage, I was starting to mess around with it, and I was starting to get parts, okay? The hand grips, not the handlebar, the hand grips back then in 1994, 35 bucks. Okay? This is for the hand grips. And I start secretly getting this stuff, trying to keep my wife from catching me. Okay? And I'm working with this. And in 1995, I was up in the bedroom. It was after church. It was one Sunday, and the phone rings. Okay? We didn't have caller ID back then. Excuse me. And lo and behold, it's Steve on the phone. Okay? Well, again, moving forward, moving backward, what God clearly was telling me as I was walking around the bedroom talking to Steve, just elated, it had been 29 years since I talked to him, God was whispering in my ear, and he was saying, tell Steve about the salvation message. And I am clearly saying to God, no, 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 no. I want to get this bike finished. And I want to see, I want to sit ahead. I'm 
Hey, so I'm, I'm having two conversations, guys. I'm having a conversation with a guy that I haven't had talked to in 29 years. And I'm having a conversation with myself and God. And God's saying, you need to talk to Steve. And I'm saying, no, guys, not doing it. God, you don't get it. I want to finish up this bike, and I want to sit out in the deck with a glass of iced tea and my wife and talk to Steve about this bike and what the salvation message is. I, want, I got this all figured out, God. Leave me alone. I got it. And God is a gentleman. He's like, okay, you got it. Okay? This is what Steve was telling me on the phone. Steve had had a very difficult life. He had just gotten out of prison about a year before for running drugs. Wealthy family allows you to get to, into a lot of trouble sometimes. He was now out of prison working for his brother Jeff, who was the same age as my sister Jean, okay, up in Richmond, believe it or not. And he was talking about how he was getting his life in order, and, and he didn't hesitate to tell me about all the heartache he had been through. God was saying, Gary, talk to him and talk to him now. The bike, the bike is the prop. Let me get the bike done. Then I'll talk to him. I know what I'm doing. God, leave me alone. Okay, no problem. So, in 1997, the restoration of this bike was finished. And it was a long process. And, as I look over the top, it was an expensive process. All right? Steve's color green. That's the bike. The seat. The seat, then, $400. That did not include chroming the, str the struts on the back. Fenders, $35 a piece. The correct back tire is $140. I was driving a 1981 Isuzu at the time. I could buy four new tires for my car for less than one correct back tire. So I settled for an incorrect Kelly Springfield back tire. All right? So I got all these parts and reflector. The rear reflector was $50. And it's just, wow. And it's like, wow, this stuff is really kind of cool. And I don't know if I can do this myself. So I have to have a professional clean it. That was another $200. All right, and meanwhile, the, the, my $4 bike was no longer a $4 bike anymore, okay? I'm still trying over the years to just kind of keep Jana from figuring out what's really going on, okay? So, whoop, sorry, moved that a couple times. The restoration is finished, and now, guess who I want to call? I'm um, delighted. I'm going to call Steve. It's been two years, all right? That's how long it took me to figure all this crazy stuff out. So I go to my... Uh, Daytimer, what we used to call in those days, and I had forgotten to write Steve's number down. Shucks. I need to call his sister Laura, right, and my sister Karen, Laura, same age. I need to get, uh, I need to get the uh, uh, Steve's phone number from Laura. So I call Laura. Hey, Laura, this is Gary Wilson down in Chesapeake. How you doing? Good. We talked for a little bit. Hey, Laura, I need Steve's phone number. Gary, Steve is dead. Stunned. Steve is dead. Laura, what happened? Drunk, less than 30 days from our conversation two years before. Steve had a brand new Corvette, interestingly enough, convertible. He's drunk, going too fast, loses control, doesn't have his seat belts on, backs into an embankment at a high rate of speed. And if you think about it, when you back into an embankment, you don't have your seat belts on, you're going backwards. Your seats act like a shoehorn, except sticking your foot in, the body's going out. And Steve was killed instantly from a broken neck. And now I've got to wrestle with the fact that I explained to God he didn't know what he was doing. I've got to get the bike finished. I've got to do that. So what I did is I made two promises. Two. One, I'm going to show the whites, the white family, Dr. White, Mrs. White, all the kids, they're all up in Richmond. I'm going to show them this bike. And number two, I'm not going to fail God again. Because I still, guys, to this day, carry that burden on my back. All right, I was disobedient. There's a price to pay for that. 
All right. So, in 1972, back and forth, take it back to spring quarter of my freshman year, my dad was a pastor. I wasn't saved. And I knew it. I told some of the classes, I'd go to camp meetings and stuff like that, and they'd have altar calls. I can remember looking at those two feet right there, hearing God saying, come on up, come on up, profess your faith. And I can remember looking at my shoes saying, you are not moving. You stay right here. And I knew, I knew in my ignorance the dice I was rolling for not being saved. I knew if something happened to me that I would not make it to heaven. I got it, and I was willing, stupidly, to take that chance. I was willing to do that. Okay, But in my freshman year of college, Terry Lowe, a head resident of the, of the dorm next to mine, called me in his room and said, hey, Gary, I want to talk to you. I said, sure. And he shared the salvation message. And it was so simple. He took a piece of paper, a piece of notebook paper, took his pencil, made all these black marks on it. Held it up. He says, this is your life. And all these black marks are your sins. And what Jesus does, he turns the paper over, he takes all the marks away. And it's like, wow, you know what? I get it. That makes sense. I got it. I'll buy into that. And in Terry's room that night in 1972, in April 1972, I accepted the Lord in my life. First time. Hey, preacher's kid, guys. We all go to a Christian school. Does that make you a Christian? Think about it. Remember this message. Didn't make me a Christian, and I knew it. But I was willing, stupidly, to take that chance. Now, flash forward 20 years later. It's 1992. The pastor of our church wants me to deliver the message. He's going to be out of town. He wants me to deliver the sermon. And it's like, gosh, I really need to make get a sermon going. God, help me to get one that makes sense, and it's very simple about the salvation message. And, lo and behold, a, a memory of Steve comes back into my mind. Now, keep in mind. At that point, it's three more years before Steve's going to call me. It's three more years before Steve assumes room temperature and exits this earth. Okay? But it was a situation that occurred, and I remembered, and it's like, wow, we can play off of that. Okay? So, flashback. 1966, we go back to Waterville, Ohio, where I grew up. All right? Now, this involves Steve, Bill, Lodshaw, a good friend of mine, and myself. I've got to paint this picture real quickly because I'm getting short on time. I live on the corner of Fifth Street and Mechanic Street. One street down is Fourth Street and Mechanic Street. This is a little tiny town up in northern Ohio. All right? And I want to pause just for a second because this portion of the slide, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher at a Christian school. And what I'm about to tell you, there, there is a disclaimer in this slide, in this little story here. Because what I'm about to tell you is a story about theft, which I don't condone, even though you have to kind of laugh at some of this stuff. What I want you to know, especially you younger people, I was in eighth grade when this took place, don't do what I did, okay? Don't do what I did. But regardless, this person that lived down on 4th Street had this huge pumpkin on their front porch. I mean, this thing was like state fair quality. It was huge. And Bill wanted to get that. He was going to steal that pumpkin. This is the way it was. And Steve and Miss Pope, you up there? Okay. Bill was one of the, he was an exceptional student. Okay. He is now an astrophysicist on the uh, faculty at Chicago, the uh, University of Chicago. Brilliant guy. Okay. One of those very smart knuckleheads that you know about. We have him in here. Okay. But anyway, Bill then steals the pumpkin. But Steve and I are like, oh, I don't think so, Bill. But Bill goes down. You've got to picture this. Down on 4th Street, a little tiny town. And he comes with this pumpkin that weighs more than he does. And he's running down the street holding this big pumpkin. Okay? And Bill and I are watching him come our way. And around the com corner comes Mrs. Ludwig, who is the neighbor of the person who Bill stole the pumpkin from. She's in her 58 Chevy wagon that's held together with rust. She looks exactly like the Wicked, Wicked, Wicked Witch of the West, and she is going to get Bill. Bill sees her coming. He drops the pumpkin. He shatters it, and he takes off at a right angle up the alley. So it's Steve and me. Now, Mrs. Ludwig knows me. A, I'm the preacher's kid. B, I live a block away, but she doesn't know Steve. Okay? 
So she pulled up, this is Gold, looking out her window. She's like, I want to know who that was. And Steve, okay, Steve is next to me. Bill is who she wants to know about. And he says, that is Steve White. Okay, Steve White. And she drives away and calls Steve's dad. And Steve's dad, of course, wants to know why he took the pumpkin. Steve would not rat out Bill. Good for Steve. He took the punishment. He got grounded. All this other stuff. He never did it. Now, guys, don't forget we got a theft thing. But also in eighth grade, that made Steve hero status on the playground. I mean, if you could take the heat for your buddies and not rat them out, whoa, that's big. Okay? So that's that's what happened in 1966. Okay. Here we are today. I don't get it. I don't get it, Mr. Wilson. What's, what's, what's all this happening? What's this pumpkin thing? have to do with this bike thing and you being in chapel, all right? Very simple, this is the second promise. I am not gonna let these opportunities in life squeak by me again. I did that mistake once before. Let's go back, let's look at the blame game, okay? Steve didn't take the pumpkin, but when Mrs. Uh, Ludwig said, who was that? He said, Steve White, fine. I'll take it, I'll call his parents, I'll make sure he gets punished, and he did. Steve didn't do it. Okay? You get my connection, guys? We hear the salvation message, Jesus died for your sins. Why? I go to a Christian school, but I don't get it. I didn't get it. Guys, I was a freshman in college before I got it. And the get it is that Jesus didn't steal the pumpkin, but he took the blame for it. Okay? Jesus took the blame for our sins. All those little black marks on the paper that Terry Lowe turned around and said, this is your life now? That's what he did. That's exactly what he did. Okay? Got it. Okay. I got it, Mr. Wilson. But what? Just what? If what you're telling me is some big, this salvation thing is some big psychobabble nonsense. What if I get to the end of my life and I find out, hey, you know what? It was wrong. Well, you know what? you got to ask yourself, if we're all wrong in this salvation thing, if we are totally incorrect and there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, then what? Well, think about it for a second. How bad could it be if you accept the Lord in your heart? You don't cheat. You don't lie. You don't steal. You don't sneak over into your neighbor's house when her husband is gone. You don't cheat on your taxes. I could go on and on. It's a good life. It's a fun life. I was a, the reason I did not accept the Lord into my heart earlier is because I thought if I do that, I'm going to lose my personality and I'm just going to be some monk sitting in a, in a, in a castle someplace writing copies of Bibles. No, it's, it's not that wrong at all. That's when you really start to live. But what if you're right? And if you're right, everything changes. God will take your hurts and your heartaches and your pain. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have a perfect, peachy, happy-go-lucky life. But you'll be able to put the stuff in perspective and you'll be able to move on. And you'll be able to understand what life is truly about and the values of life. All right? And if you're right, just by chance, Wilson, if you're right, you can't help but look at John 10.10. 10, because suddenly... This verse applies. I have come that they may have life and they may have life more abundantly. We don't have time to talk about the word abundantly. Mr. Mack teaches Greek. He can do a deep dive on that. Whoa. Buy into it, guys. Buy into it. I've been where you are right now. So if you do the, yourself the math, can I afford to be wrong? What if you get to the end and, and you don't make this decision and then you find out Wilson was right and I was wrong, I being you? Uh-oh, we got a big problem, and it's a big one. Now, two final slides. Actually, there's three, if I had it, all right? Might not. This picture has been reproduced in lots of different versions, and I love this picture, all right? Jesus is knocking on the door. You can't see it real well because of the light. But Jesus is knocking on the door, and you've seen lots of variations of this. There's one thing that's really unique about this picture. There's no door knock. There's no door knock. Jesus cannot open the door. 
You on the inside have got to open the door. That's what you have to do. He is not going to take an axe and barge his way into your life or into your room. He will not. And if you don't respond, that's what you have to deal with. And I love that verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, which is family, guys. I will dine with you. We've got some friends coming out to dinner tonight. We are going to dine together because that's what friends do. Okay? And him with me. Revelation 3.20. I wanted to work in our last verse. Sorry. But the bottom line is this, guys. Here we are, January 30th. The bike, what did it cost me? I know you're all thinking that. 1200 bucks in those dollars. Today it's, it's, uh, it's 1800 Now here's the real funny story about this. I'll make it fast. I know we're late. Ms. Ms. Hank, hey, give me the 20 bucks back. Where are you? All right? Here's the kind of funny part. When I was almost ready to take it to the paint shop, I had to spend all this money. One of the guys up in New York, John Salini, said, hey, Wilson, he says, I'm curious, what's your serial number? Well, I don't know. He said, well, go get it. I went out and gave him the serial number. He said, I got bad news for you. He said, that's a 1967 frame. What difference does that make? He says, well, it makes a lot of difference. Because what Schwinn did is they took this post and this post, and they did this, which took the seat and made it go back further, and the handlebars come up further, and it made it so big kids could ride it even better. And he said, Wilson, it's like you've bought all of these parts for a 57 Chevy, and now you're putting them on a 55. This doesn't make any sense. I said, John, can you find me a frame? He says, I'll look. Okay, two months later, he calls me up and says, Wilson, I got the frame. I said, okay, how much is it? $200. I said, okay, when are you gonna send it? I'll send it tomorrow. By the way, a frame is this, Right here, no chain guard and a fork. That's it. So I hurry home for the next couple days, tried to beat the UPS man there. <sighs> Look around, no big box, good deal. I finally, I walk it, third, fourth day, no big box, good deal. I got home in time, and the, I hear the UPS truck, I'll run out, and I'll, I'll, I'll hide this stupid frame. I walk in the house, there is this rusted frame on the island in our house, standing upright. And he's like, it's not in the box. <laughs> Kids are at school. It's like, uh-oh. And Jana says to me, what is this? And of course, I get the highly intelligent answer. Oh, looks like a bike frame to me. <laughs> Why is it here? And I told her the story. She says, let me get this right. So that means out of your $4 bike, there is nothing that you're going to use. And it was like, how dare you? Of course I'm going to use stuff. She said, what? I said, lots of stuff. Like what? I said, well, there's lots of bike parts that I'm going to use. Them. She said, show me one. And that hub right there, that hub, not the wheel, that hub I used, and the seat post I used, and everything else I did. But my wife is forgiven. Okay? So yeah, if you did this today, that was $1,800 to do that bike. All right? A lot of money, a lot of craziness. But you know what? This bike has paid off because of the message that God gave me to share, not just with you guys, with other people. Don't make the mistakes I did. We need to get out of here in this Hampton and everybody else, I'm sorry. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. DJ, I asked if you would pray me in. Would you come up and pray us out? And guys, I'll be here for a few minutes if you want to talk. If all you want to do is get out of, out of class, go to class. Okay? So everybody in my third bell, hang in there. I will be back. DJ, if you would. Oh, bye, guys, for prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the message that you allowed Mr. Wilson to speak to us. I pray that the words that he said to us, I pray that we take them in and we apply them to our lives. I pray that we don't let a moment that goes by where we can't share the message of Jesus Christ into somebody's life. I pray that you would give us the words to say to them, oh God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.